Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing, or at least making a start on my review of Birthday Letters by Ted Hughes. So this is a collection of his poetry, and uh, we don't actually have a blurb for this, I don't think, so I'm not going to read it out to you. What I am going to do, what I normally do with poetry, is read out some of the poems, and then at the end I'm going to give you some of my overall thoughts and a rating. So let's start with Visit. Lucas, my friend, one among those three or four who stay unchanged, like a separate self, a stone in the bed of the river, under every change, became your friend. I heard of it, alerted. I was sitting youth away in an office near Slough, near me, morning and evening between Slough and Holborn, hoarding wage to fund a leap to freedom, and the other side of the earth a free fall to strip my chrysalis off me in the slipstream. Weekends I recidived into alma mater. Girlfriend shared a supervisor and weekly session with your American rival and you. She detested you. She fed snapshots of you and she did not know what inflammable celluloid into my silent, insatiable future, my blind man's buff, internal torch of search. With my friend after midnight, I stood in a garden, lobbing soil clods up at a dark window. Drunk, he was certain it was yours. Half as drunk, I did not know he was wrong. Nor did I know I was being auditioned for the male lead in your drama, miming through the first easy movements as if with eyes closed, feeling for the role as if a puppet were being tied on its strings, or a dead frog's legs touched by electrodes. I jigged through those gestures, watched and judged, only by starry darkness and a shadow, unknown to you and not knowing you, aiming to find you, and missing, and again missing, flinging earth at a glass that could not protect you because you were not there. Ten years after your death, I meet on a page of your journal as never before, the shock of your joy when you heard of that, then the shock of your prayers, and under those prayers your panic, the prayers might not create the miracle, then, under the panic, the nightmare that came rolling to crush you. Your alternative, the unthinkable old despair and the new agony, melting into one familiar hell. Suddenly I read all this, your actual words as they floated out through your throat and tongue and onto your page, just as when your daughter, years ago now, drifting in, gazing up into my face, mystified, where I worked alone in the silent house, asked suddenly, Daddy, where's Mummy? The freezing soil of the garden as I clawed it, all around me that midnight's giant clock of frost, and somewhere inside it wanting to feel nothing, a pulse of fever, somewhere inside that numbness of the earth, our future trying to happen. I look up as if to meet your voice with all its urgent future that has burst in on me, then look back at the book of the printed words. You are ten years dead. It is only a story. Your story. My story. So this is called The Shot. Your worship needed a god. Where it lacked one, it found one. Ordinary jocks became gods, deified by your infatuation, that seemed to have been designed at birth for a god. It was a god seeker, a god finder. Your daddy had been aiming you at god when his death touched the trigger. In that flash you saw your whole life. You ricocheted the length of your alpha career with the fury of a high velocity bullet that cannot shed one foot pound of kinetic energy. The elect more or less died on impact. They were too mortal to take it. They were mind stuff, provisional, speculative, mere auras sound barrier events along your flight path, but inside your sob-sodden Kleenex and your Saturday night panics, under your hair done this way and done that way, behind what looked like rebounds and the cascade of cries diminuendo, you were undeflected, you were gold jacketed, solid silver, nickel tipped, trajectory perfect as through ether, even the cheek scar where you seemed to have sideswiped concrete served as a rifling groove to keep you true, till your real target hid behind me, your daddy the god with a smoking gun. For a long time, vague as mist, I did not even know I had been hit, or that you had gone clean through me, to bury yourself at last in the heart of the god. In my position, the right witch doctor might have caught you in flight with his bare hands, tossed you, cooling one hand to the other, godless, happy, quieted. I managed a wisp of your hair, your ring, your watch, your nightgown. This one's called God Help the Wolf After Whom the Dogs Do Not Bark, and Sylvia Plath is the wolf. I am also the wolf. I don't know if I can... Oh, God. I am the wolf. Wolfie woo. There you met it, the mystery of hatred, after your billions of years in anonymous matter. That was where you were found and promptly hated. You tried your utmost to reach and touch those people with gifts of yourself. Just like your first words as a toddler, when you rushed at every visitor to the house, clasping their legs and crying, I love you, I love you. Just as you had danced for your father in the home of anger, gifts of your life to sweeten his slow death and mix yourself in it, where he lay propped on the couch to sugar the bitterness of his raging death. You searched for yourself to go on giving it, as if after the nightfall of his going you danced on in the dark house, eight years old in your tinsel. Searching for yourself in the dark as you danced, 
floundering a little, crying softly, like somebody searching for somebody drowning in dark water, listening for them in panic at losing those listening seconds from your searching, then dancing wilder in the silence. The colleges lifted their heads. It did seem you disturbed something just perfected that they were holding carefully, all of a piece, till the glue dried. And as if reporting some felony to the police, they let you know that you were not John Don. You no longer care. Did you save their names? But then they let you know, day by day, their contempt for everything you attempted. Took pains to inject their bile, as for your health, into your morning coffee. Even signed their homeopathic letters. Envelopes full of carefully broken glass, to lodge behind your eyes so you would see. Nobody wanted your dance. Nobody wanted your strange glitter, your floundering, drowning life and your effort to save yourself. Treading water, dancing the dark turmoil, looking for something to give. Whatever you found, they bombarded with splinters, derision, mud. The mystery of that hatred. And this is quite a long one here, but it's about Paris. And I want to go to Paris, but I can't because everything's in lockdown. Alright, there's just one more poem I wanted to read from this collection to you. And then I'm going to give you some thoughts. So this is Night Ride on Ariel. Your moon was full of women. Your moon mother there, over your bed. The Tyrolean moon, the guttural mourning and remaking herself. It was always Monday in her mind. Prouty was there, tender and buoyant moon whose wand of beams so dainty put the costly sparkle into Cinderella. Boitsche, moon of dismemberment and resurrection, who found enough parts on the floor of her shop to fill your old skin and get you walking into Tuesday. Mary Ellen Chase, silver nimbus lit, egg eyes hooded, the moon owl who found you, even in England, and plucked you out of my nest and carried you back to college, dragging you all the way, your toes trailing in the Atlantic. Phases of your dismal-headed fairy godmother moon, Mother making you dance with her magnetic eye on your daddy's coffin, there in the family film. Prouty wafting you to the ballroom of broken glass on bleeding feet. Boitcher twanging the puppet strings that waltzed you in air out of your mythical grave to jig with your daddy's bones on a kind of tightrope over the gap of your real grave. Mary Ellen Moon of Massachusetts struck you with her chiming claw and turned you into an hourglass of moonlight with its menstrual wound of shadow sand. She propped you on her lectern. Lecture timer, white faced bolts of electrocuting moonlight, masks of the overfull or overfull or empty moon that tipped your heart upside down and drained it. As you flew, they jammed all your wavelengths with their crisscross instructions, crackling and dragging their blacks over your flailing light, hauling your head this way and that way as you clung to the sun, to the last shred of the exploded dawn in your fist that Monday. So yeah, overall, I mean, as you can tell, pretty much all the poems in here are about or inspired by Sylvia Plath in some way, which made it more interesting for me because I'm not a massive Ted Hughes fan. After reading this, I have become more of a Ted Hughes fan, although I do still prefer Plath. Overall, I gave it a 3.75 out of 5. It's not like my exact kind of poetry that I really love, but um, it's close to it, and I can see how his work's inspired a lot of people whose work I really enjoy. So there we have it, that's what I made of Birthday Letters by Ted Hughes. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.